Dr. Rico here. This is an introduction to my mini course, Robotic Planning and Kinematics. The syllabus link and notes are in the description. 1.4, the bug two algorithm, the final algorithm we'll consider. Let us now try to design a new algorithm that generates shorter paths than bug one. The perceived problem with bug one is that each obstacle needs to be fully explored before the robot can proceed towards the goal. Can we do better, i.e., can we decide to leave the obstacle without traversing all its boundary? We use the term start goal line, start to goal line, to refer to the unique line that passes through the start point and goal point. The start goal line is the dashed line intersecting the two obstacles as shown on the left of figure 110. Here's figure 110. We see the start point and the goal point. To aid in the design of bug two, we begin with a preliminary version that we will almost immediately abandon, but we'll start with it. So the preliminary algorithm is while not at the goal, move towards the goal along the start goal line. If we hit an obstacle, follow the obstacle's boundary, moving either left or right, until you encounter the start goal line again and are able to move toward the goal. Okay, the example execution on the right of figure 110 amounts to an undesired periodic cyclic trap again. So let's take a look. So this is pretty good. We start, we encounter the obstacle, we go around, we find that start goal line again, we follow it until we get to it again, we go to the goal and we're done. So that worked. Now, if we have this situation where we start here, we go toward the goal, we encounter the obstacle, we turn left, we go back until we encounter the start goal line and then we head back toward the goal, but this is actually gonna create a cycle where we never leave this corner here, right? Not desirable which is why it's only the preliminary bug two algorithm. How do we improve and possibly fix this misbehavior in our algorithm? It turns out that a small fix is sufficient. For convenience, we repeat the entire algorithm, but the only difference is the addition of the requirement that the leave point be closer to the goal than the hit point, okay? So if you go back up here, this can't be our leave point now because we're not closer to the goal, okay? We're further from the goal than our hit point. Our hit point is here, our leave point is here, so we aren't closer to the goal here, so we would just keep on going all the way around until we get to here, at which point we would leave and the algorithm would work just fine. So that was the fix. So again, while not at the goal, move towards the goal along the start goal line. If we hit an obstacle, follow the boundary in one direction or the other until you encounter the start goal line again, closer to the goal and are able to move towards the goal. Okay, good. From the left of figure 111, we see that bug two finds a path to the goal where bug two prelim did not. So if we look down here at figure 111, the left-hand side, a, we start at start, we go to one, go to two, go to three. We don't stop here at this start goal line because it's further away to the goal than our hit point. So we keep going until we encounter the start goal line and then we head towards the goal until we encounter another object and then we go around again. So that's that's the uh, slightly modified version of the bug two algorithm, or the, the bug two algorithm is what we'll just call it now. Let us briefly mention the requirements of bug two, although we will compare them more carefully in section 143. For bug zero, we assumed the robot can sense directions towards the goal, and it knows when it has reached the goal. For bug one and bug two, both of them, we assume the robot can measure and store in memory the distances and directions to the goal point that it senses along the boundary. 
In particular, bug 2 stores distance and direction at the hit point and compares these two quantities with the ones it senses along the boundary. Monotonic performance and its implications. Here we briefly discuss why our correction to the bug2 prelim algorithm is indeed helpful and has a chance to render the algorithm correct. Consider the function of time equal to the distance between the robot and the goal point. This distance is a function of time because the robot is moving. Let us plot this distance function of time along the execution of the bug2 algorithm, shown here, and we labeled these points 1, 2, 3, 4, and we will then have here the distance from the robot to the goal. So at start, we're this distance. At 1, we're this distance, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. Notice that when we go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, we actually get further away from the goal, but uh, then once we swing around here, we've Get, get closer to the goal. Great. As the figure illustrates, the leave point is closer to the goal than the hit point. Okay, that was a requirement of the bug2 algorithm. Of course, throughout the search phase, while the robot is moving along the boundary to find the optimal leave point, the distance function may not always decrease, but after the search phase is complete, the robot will indeed be closer to the goal. This discussion establishes that the distance between the robot and the goal is a monotonic, which means that it is only increasing or decreasing, in this case, decreasing. A monotonic function of time pairs well with Jin when the robot is away from any obstacles. Okay, so we might get a little further away from the goal while we're traversing an obstacle, but while we're not traversing an obstacle, we'll never go from a point that's closer to the goal to a point that's further away from the goal. Okay. Monotonicity immediately implies that there can be no cycles and therefore no infinite cycles in the execution of the algorithm. The lack of such cycles is true because one, the leave point is closer to the goal than the hit point, and two, when the robot moves away from the obstacle, the distance continues to decrease. Therefore, it is impossible for the robot to hit the same obstacle again at the same hit point. Try to draw a counterexample of this, and I think you'll see the problem. The performance of the bug2 algorithm. Let us now analyze the performance of the bug2 algorithm. When the usual convention we introduced before, d is the distance between start and goal, and O sub i is the perimeter of the ith obstacle, we have the following results. Theorem 2.2, performance of bug2. Consider a workspace with n obstacles and assume that the bug2 algorithm finds a path to the goal. The following properties hold. 1. Bug2 does not find the shortest path in general. 2. The path length generated by bug2 is lower bounded by d, if it just goes straight to the goal from the start. No obstacles are encountered. Three, the path length generated by bug2 is upper bounded by d, the distance that we would go directly straight line to the goal, plus the sum of these c parameters times the perimeter of the objects divided by two. And the c parameter is the number of intersections of the start goal line with the boundary of obstacle oi. Okay, we're gonna look at this a little bit closer. So proof. The first statement is obvious that bug2 does not find the shortest path in general. Regarding the second statement, the lower bound is the same as that for bug1, no surprise here. Regarding the third statement, so this is, this is the one that is a little bit more complex, the upper bound is different from that for bug1 and is due to the following fact. Each time bug2 hits an obstacle at a hit point, it might need to travel the entire obstacle's perimeter before finding an appropriate leave point. So for each pair of hit point and leave point, two intersection points, the bug two travels at most the obstacle's perimeter. Okay, in like the worst possible case. Comparison between bug algorithms. After introducing the bug one and two algorithms, let us compare 
in terms of path length. We ignore bug zero in this discussion because we have already established it is not correct via the example in figure 1.3. Without loss of generality, let us assume both the bug one and bug two algorithms are left turning. Okay, it could be right turning, but uh, we'll just pick one. Example where bug two finds a shorter path than bug one. Recall that the bug two algorithm was introduced in an attempt to find shorter paths by not fully exploring the boundary of each encountered obstacle. Indeed, it appears that bug two works better in our running example, as shown in figure 1.12. So if we look here on the left, we have the bug one algorithm running, and we see that it has to go around entirely the, the perimeter and then halfway back. And then it hits here, and again, it traverses the entire thing more than once. Whereas if we use the bug two algorithm, we go in a pretty efficient line to the goal. So performance is pretty good here. The efficiency or the optimality um, is pretty good. However, it is not clear that this fact must hold true for any problem. Okay, Remember that a problem is determined by the workspace, the obstacles, and start and goal positions. So could be that this isn't always the case. And sure enough, here's a counterexample where instead bug one is better than bug two. Looking at the environment in figure 113, we see that bug one explores the entire perimeter of the obstacle only once and then moves to the point P leave before leaving the obstacle for the goal. So let's take a look at this. So here's the bug one algorithm running in this strange space and then this bug two algorithm running here. So let's think about how this would work. Bug one algorithm, we would hit, we would turn left, right? So we would traverse the entire perimeter this way, around, 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 all the way through on this side, the left fingers, it calls it later, to here. Now it's going to say, oh, I know that the closest point that I was at is this one up here. So then it has to go back and re retrace its steps, go one direction or the other, whichever is shorter, and then depart from P leave to get to P goal. Okay? So it has to go around the entire thing like once, um, about one and a half times. Whereas bug two, okay, we start here, we hit this, we'll call it a left finger, okay, because it's protruding out this way. Uh, I think for you guys, it's this way. Okay, so for the bug two algorithm, we start here, we hit, we turn left, we go around, and we encounter the start goal line here, okay, but we can't go towards the goal. We, we skipped this one because it was further away than the original, so we won't go. This one, we can't step towards the goal, so we keep going, and here we go. Now we hit that line we're going to go up to here and we we hit the left finger again so now we have to turn left go all the way back to reach reverse all this stuff okay and now we're closer again so we go we hit again we turn left and we go all the way back down and then all the way back up until we get to here and then we leave again and we go all the way down then all the way back up and then finally we leave from here and we reach our goal turns out that this one's longer than this one. So there's a case for which the bug two algorithm is actually not as efficient as the bug one algorithm. Okay. Summary of path length. Bug one performs an exhaustive search by examining all possible leaf points before committing to the optimal choice. Bug two is a greedy algorithm that takes the first available leaf point that is closer to the goal without any specific performance guarantee. While it is impossible to predict which of the two will outperform in an arbitrary environment, we may say that bug two will outperform bug one in many simple environments, but bug one has more predictable performance. So let's summarize. The bug algorithms have slightly different assumptions on the sensors, and capabilities needed by the robot. So table 1.1 right here summarizes these capabilities. Direction to the goal, distance to the goal, memory, linear odometer, 
angular odometer or compass. Recall that a linear odometer was an optional sensor ca slash capability for bug one, and it allowed the robot to return to the leave point using the shorter of the two paths along the boundary. Okay, so let's actually fill in. Th there's, there's. Uh, we'll read these off, and then we'll, when we encounter these, these fill in the blanks, we'll fill them in. So, first of all, for the sensor or capability direction to the goal. All three of the algorithms require this. Okay, you got to have that capability of your robot. Distance to the goal, uh, the bug zero doesn't need it. Okay, it doesn't require that you know the distance to the goal. Uh, bug one and bug two, both of them do require it. Memory, so the bug zero algorithm doesn't require any memory. Okay, which was a nice thing about it, but it also sucked. So there's that. Bug one does require memory. And so does bug two, okay? So both of these algorithms require some memory. The linear odometer is not required for bug zero. It's optional for bug one, but it's not required for bug two. The angular odometer or compass is not required for bug zero. And it's required for both bug one and bug two. The new sensor or capability of an angular odometer or compass is needed in order for the robot to store the direction to goal in memory. This is required in bug one to determine when circumnavigation is complete. Remember, that's how it checks to know if it's made it all the way around. And in bug two, to determine when the start goal line is encountered. The direction to the goal must be stored in a known reference frame. For example, as a counterclockwise angle relative to a fixed x-axis, so that measured directions can be compared to the stored directions. The robot could define a local reference frame based on its heading, but this frame would rotate with the robot. It is not useful to store a direction in such a frame unless the robot also somehow records the orientation of the frame when the direction was measured. There are two possible fixes for this problem illustrated in figure 114. The first option is that the robot has a compass and can then record the direction to goal relative to a fixed orientation given by the compass. Of course, we're all familiar with a compass that stays fixed to the Earth reference frame, right? This is shown as the angle alpha 1 relative to north on the left of figure 114, so this guy here. The second option is that the robot can cause an angular odometer to measure changes in its heading, so it keeps track of them. The robot can use its initial heading at P start as the orientation for its reference frame. The direction to goal can be specified in this initial reference frame as the sum of two angles, as shown on the right of the figure over here. The angle alpha 2 can be measured with the aid of an angular odometer, and the angle alpha 3 is the output of the direction to goal sensor. This discussion highlights some subtleties in the assumptions we have made on robot capabilities. While the bug algorithms seem very simple at first glance, they actually require fairly strong assumptions on the sensing and knowledge of the robot. These assumptions are discussed in more detail by Taylor and Lavelle, so check out that paper, iBug. All right, that's all I've got for this. Take care.